Good morning, everyone. It's always a, a blessing to be before the congregation here in San Jose. Just want to thank the leadership here for having me once again. And I pray that the, the things work out with the minister the evangelist that has been selected uh, here. It's a beautiful day. It's a wonderful week last week. You know, I, I had an opportunity to go and get my flu shot last Thursday, I think it was, Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday. I was fine before the flu shot. Next morning, next day, I got a little itchy throat, coughing and just a weird feeling in my throat. I didn't have it before. And I'm like, oh, okay, I, I know it's from the shot. But I would advise everyone to get your flu shot, get your vaccine, whatever, get your booster. I tell you, uh, co-workers, uh, uh, loved one passed away because he refused to get the shot. I don't know how it went, but he brought it home and it took his loved one out. So for those that don't want to get the shot, you think you can, you're so concerned with, the problem is they're so concerned with what's going to happen later down the road. But what our Lord teach us is that you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. What is your life but a vapor that appeared for a moment and then vanishes away? What we need to understand is that we need to be able to make it out of today. Let us take it a, a day at a time. I want you all to remember what I'm getting ready to read to you because it's going to play a major role in what I'm teaching today. The parable of the tenant, the tenants. In uh, Matthew chapter 21, starting with verse 33, Jesus tells his disciples, here another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into a far country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first. And they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Today's lesson will be coming out of Revelations chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. You see, it's another scene where Jesus, the Father, is sitting on the throne. And Jesus standing next to him. So my introduction. The Father is the source from which all things have their beginning. Rather there be the things in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and in the sea. What we must understand is that Jesus is coming again. Soon, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 6 tells us, And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angels to show his servants what must soon take place. We can rely on the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because they are trustworthy and true. We can rely on that. The creator has been warning man since his fall concerning his obedience and his disobedience. 
You see, the Lord God is a loving and kind creator. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, Amos says that the Lord God is a loving and kind creator. He does not send disaster without first a warning. That's like when we deal with our kids. We warn them first, and then we warn them again. And we may warn them a third time, but after that, the rod is coming. It's coming. So, for the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. See, the word of God was hidden. The mystery of God was hidden in God for the foundation of creation. In Ephesians chapter 1, we find out that we were to be in the beloved one before the foundation of creation. So it's not a mistake because of what transpired in the garden that God decided to send his son. Let's not think that way. You see, sometimes it's just good to keep things to yourself until the appropriate time to reveal them. You see, as the disciples asked Jesus concerning some things in Matthew chapter 24, concerning when will all these things take place and what will be the sign of his coming. And Jesus tells them in Matthew 24 and 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the son, but the Father only. You see, the Father has kept some things to himself. He is the source from which all things flow, from which Christ came, from which the Holy Spirit came, from eternity to display the work of the Lord in the universe. So, in Revelations chapter 5, Verse 1 through 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because... No one was able and worthy to open the scroll and to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scrolls and its seven seals. You see, John, having seen the father and his glorious throne, in chapter 4, where he saw the Father as a jasper stone, as a carnelian stone, and an emerald, and a rainbow encircling his throne. He saw all of that. What a mighty sight to see. You know, God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. It's many ways he come and see. Passed by Abraham, and Abraham said, Lord, please don't pass me by. When he came to tell him of things pertaining to the future, you see. So, having seen the Father in his glorious throne, John, attention is now drawn to the scroll in the right hand of the Father. The redeeming lamb takes the scroll and prepares to open the seals, initiating God's judgment in the day of the Lord and the beginning of the reclam reclamation of the earth in preparation for God's direct rule. And I saw John's focus now shifts from the details of the throne and the living creatures and elders to that which lays upon the right hand 
of him who sat on the throne. You see, in Isaiah chapter 53, can be said to be the holy of holies of the Old Testament, then Revelations chapter 5 should hold that same high honor because we are speaking about a lamb that appears to be freshly slain. So in the right hand, the side of favor and strength. Now I know, says uh, Psalms chapter 20 and verse 6, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. It's the right side of God. In Psalms 98 and 1, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. On the throne. The position from which the Father rules affairs, all of his affairs in the universe. You see, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, Isaiah says in chapter 6 and verse 1. And as we look, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, as I look, thrones were placed in the Ancient of Days took his seat. This is after Christ was lifted up into the heavens. Okay. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. You see, the throne pictures both sovereignty and judgment. It's what we're dealing with here. As in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 11, then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. As he saw in the right hand of the one who sat on the throne, a scroll, uh, Biblian also rendered book, as in Revelations chapter 1 and verse 11, and chapter 3 and verse 5. The scroll is also sealed. Great prophetic streams find their fulfillment in the opening of the scroll. You see, we, we take it, therefore, that the opening of the seals of this book is the enlargement, development, and continuation of the book of Daniel. Describing from God's side the judgments necessary to secure the fulfillment of all that he has foretold through all the prophets and the apostles. You see, when we look at the scroll and, we, and when we look at how things transpired in the Old Testament dealing with lands, we can look at this scroll as an ancient will. The little book is in the form of an ancient will, which was usually sealed with seven seals of seven witnesses. You see, the view here is advantage of explaining the emphasis found here upon the earth uh, and the death of the lamb, which we see in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6 and verse 9. Also, the events which transpires following the loosening of the seals are directly related to Christ's inheritance. So as in Psalms chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3 describes the rebellious world forces gathered together to try to prevent God's Messiah from taking tenant, remember, tenant possession or administration of the earth. Psalms chapter 2 and 7 records that when the Messiah 
uh, confronts this challenge, he will declare what God has already decreed concerning him. We must understand this. What God decreed is that thou art my son. The biblical term for son involves the concept of heir. That's why when, the, when we read uh, in Matthew chapter 21, uh, 33 through 37, we understand that Jesus Christ, he said, I will send my heir and they will respect him. We read in Galatians chapter 4 and 7 concerning the heir. Thus says God's son, the Messiah, is the heir of an inheritance given to him by God. Psalms chapter 2 and verse 8 presents God's description of that inheritance. He says, I shall give thee the nations for thine own inheritance and the other parts, other most parts of the earth for thy possession. You see, a purchase was made at the cross. And now the deed of that purchase is being claimed by its rightful owner. That is why God is sitting on the throne, the father, with the scroll in his right hand, you see? So, going back into a little bit of history dealing with Jerusalem and Jeremiah, while Babylon had besieged Jerusalem, God told Jeremiah to purchase a plot of ground in Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 32, uh, verses 14 and 15, and 43 and 44, you see? Even though the land had fallen to uh, Babylon, Jeremiah's purchase demonstrated the reality of God's promise to restore Israel back to the land. So when we read in Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 9 through 15, and I bought the field at Anath from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver, I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and the conditions and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Barak, the son of Neriah, son of Mahasiah, in the presence of Hanamalel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. I charged Barak in their presence saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed and put them in an earthenware vessel that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. We must understand this. There are significant parallels between Jeremiah's deed of purchase and Messiah's redemption described in this chapter. His redemption, in both cases, a purchase was made in advance and a period intervened before the possession was fully awarded at that future date. You see, a deed of purchase. By opening of the scroll, the lamb takes his inheritance, that which he had already purchased in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. In Psalms chapter 2 and verse 6 through 8, his inheritance included an enduring kingdom in the title deed of the earth. But what is this remarkable scroll? You see, it is nothing less than the title deed of the earth itself. It is clearly the antitype of all the rich typological teaching associated with the divinely specified procedures of the land redemption in the Old Testament. The seal scrolls is a deed of purchase for mankind's tenant possession, inheritance, or administration of the earth that was forfeited when mankind fell away from God. The 
it was forfeited. Satan took it. A scroll deed of purchase was made when Christ paid the redemption price to redeem mankind's tenant possession of the earth by the shedding of his blood on the cross. That's why when God put Adam, told him that he shall have dominion over all things, man shall rule. Well, he meant that. And Jesus is of the line of David, and he is ruling right now. As the Lamb opens the scroll, these very aspects of its contents work in harmony to reveal the consummation of history. You see, people who are very educated sometimes seem to forget that there is one sitting on an invisible throne that is in control of history. You see, from this it may be concluded that the scroll contains the un the unveiling of the mystery of God that the Old Testament prophets foretold. You see, thus the seals con conceal the mystery which only Christ can disclose, according to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 9 and Revelations 10 and 4, of how God's judgment in his kingdom will come as the new Jerusalem. You see, written inside the scroll is the tablets of the testimony uh, when God revealed his law to Moses it was written on both sides as we look and see in uh, Exodus chapter 32 and verse 15 Let's see so Jeremiah's deeds was sealed see. until the seals are broken the contents of the book are inaccessible they remain in unrevealed mystery as in Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 11 in the vision of all this has become to you like a like the words of a book that is sealed when man give it to one who can read say and read this he says I cannot read it for it is sealed and when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this. He says, I cannot read. Same as in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 26, the visions of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal the vision, for it is for it many days to come. Even in our own day, when such, uh, with so much within the scriptures has been revealed, according to Revelation chapter 22 and 10, God's word remains sealed to certain individuals. So many people, you hand them the Bible and you open that book up to a certain passage, they can't understand it. It's sealed. One of us who has been given the key to unlock it will do so. Who is worthy to open it is what? The Spirit says to John in chapter 5 of Revelations, verse 2. Who is worthy to open? A mighty angel shouts out a challenge for everyone to come forth. Who is worthy to open the great scroll and its seals? All the creation in heaven and earth and under the earth stood motionless and speechless. No one had nothing to say. That's mighty. No one had the authority and the virtue for such a task. As the echoes of his cry recede, there is only silence. Who is worthy? The powerful angel Michael and Gabriel do not answer. Uncounted thousands of other angels remain silent. All the righteous dead of all the ages, including Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Job, Moses, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Peter, and the rest of the apostles, Paul, and all the others from the church age, says nothing. 
The question of worthiness hinges on several factors. Only Christ has the necessary qualifications. Perfect judgment. A combination of perfect justice and perfect compassion. One who extends perfect mercy while not flinching from exacting perfect justice. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 7 and verse 24, do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, according to Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. See, he must discharge his office as judge, not shrinking from the administration of discipline or punishment where it is needed. Because he is true, according to uh, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, he cannot alter the standards of God which condemn sin. Can't offer. Can't offer. Ability to possess. The right to possess is meaningless without the might to possess it. Can't do it. You see, no ordinary man, okay, no ordinary man can accept the responsibility of opening its sealed pages. No one was able. All men except one are born of Adam and are lost in sin and are therefore unqualified to bring about the redemption. You are in Adam. You are from that line. You have not been baptized in the body of Christ for the remission of sin. Then you're still on the other side. What then? Says Romans chapter 3 and verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Everyone. You see, when Adam forfeited the dominion in the fall, all men born of the line of Adam fell with him. I'm not going to get into uh, inherited sin or, or whatever it may be. You just watch that kid and watch him grow up. Throughout history, there have been many pretenders to Earth's throne who have sought to conquer and rule the world. You can look through your history and you can see Hitler, Napoleon, and all the rest. But the first and most powerful and notorious usurper was Satan. After his rebellion against God, he was crushed, and his angelic followers were thrown out of heaven. We read about that in Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. And he became the God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. Getting ready to close up here. I wept much is a present tense. In perfect tense, I was weeping. John evidently understood the significance of the scroll and the great need to open it and to read its contents. Imagine that. No one answering nothing. And it's just total silence. You see. From this we understand overwhelming sadness attends any future which continues apart from redemption. We must think about what Christ has done for us. For the horrors of sin, sickness, murder, death. And the warping of all things God intended for good will continue unabated for unending millennia if it were not for the cross of Christ. Thankfully, man was not left abandoned to a history of self-perpetuated depravity. We must understand for history is our story. So, in my final thought, do not weep. There is hope. A present tense.
imperative, indicating that John continued to weep. But the mighty angel told him, one of the elders told him, do not weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah has revealed that the ruler would be like, God had revealed the ruler would be like a lion of the offspring of Judah, according to Genesis chapter 49, verses 9 and 10, and Psalms chapter 60, and verse 7. You see, Jesus was the root of David. He is the root of David. Jesus was born in the line of David. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. You see, God made an unconditional covenant with David where he swore that his throne would be established like the sun in the moon, according to Psalms chapter 89, verse 33. 37. Weep no more. We have hope. We have Christ as the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah who has paved the way for us to be with the Father in all eternity. Think about how the Father is sitting with the scroll in his hand. And the question is asked, who is worthy? None of us are worthy of the gift, the unspeakable gift that God has given us today. It costs the heavens a life, and all the things that you can even picture a dream of can't even compare to what the heaven has given us. If you stand in need of prayer, brothers here, we will pray for you. If you are not a Christian and you desire to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. We will baptize you, and your name will go written into the Lamb's Book of Life. That on that day, when the books are open, your name will appear. Believe that. It is a trustworthy saying. Amen.